All right, so this evening we're continuing on the series I just started this morning on the attributes of God and, you know, God's characteristics, God's attributes. And this morning we covered some of, you know, God's anger and wrath and his fury. And this evening we're going to cover the attributes of God where, where God believes in, in justice. God is a God of justice and um, vengeance. So this has to do with, with making things right and, and just being like an arbiter, being a judge, giving judgment, defining right and wrong, you know, giving us morality. This all comes from God, and this is part of who God is. God has given us, you know, we're made in the image of God, and there's a lot of things that God has given to man in the way that we are that are, that are natural to us that reflect who God is. Every, we all have a, a natural instinct for, for wanting justice to be served, for, for wanting things to be a proper balance. When someone does something wrong, there needs to be a penalty for that. There, there needs, we, we have this innate sense of justice that is built within us, and that comes from God because God is a God of justice. And since God is a God of justice, of course, we need to be going to God's words to understand justice itself and understand who God is and, and to get our judgment or our understanding of what's right and what's wrong directly from God's word. And this is, you know, it sounds real basic and simple, doesn't it? I mean, it doesn't sound like something that anyone really should be in argument with, at least those who claim that the Bible is true, those who claim to believe in God or believe in Jesus Christ. It's a real simple statement to make, yet why is it that if you're going to talk to those same people who probably have no problem with the statements I just made, oh yeah, of course, God's a God of justice, yeah, God wants to, you know, he decides what's right and wrong, but then you go to, you know, you open up Leviticus, you open up Deuteronomy, you open up God's law, and they'll be like, oh no, no way, I mean, that's, that's just, just, we can't have that. And they start to judge God's law as being something that's wicked or evil or wrong and that that's not proper justice, right? Because you think about justice, justice is supposed to just be like a balance of scales. So you have, that's why they have that, uh, that imagery in the court system and stuff, right? That lady justice that's blindfolded because it's not, she's not supposed to be a respecter of persons. It's supposed to just be whatever's right is right, whatever's wrong is wrong. And these are good principles that that symbol represents because these are all things that we can find in the Bible. Blind justice, scales, meaning on, on one side you've got a, a sin or iniquity or a transgression, and the other side you've got the recompense of that, you've got the penalty. They're supposed to balance out. And this is the way that God is. But these days you'll have people who claim to believe in the Bible and claim to believe that justice should come from God will look at things, especially when, you know, we'll just say it, the, the homosexuality, sodomy, right? When the Bible says that they which do such things are worthy of death, people, they freak out about that. And, and say, whoa, no way, no, I mean, even if they would go as far as to say, yeah, it's not right, it's an abomination, people shouldn't do it, but I mean, against the law, well, God said that it should be against the law. And God said that the penalty isn't just a fine. It's not a jail sentence. It's a death penalty. And this is coming from a God of justice. The God that determines the right penalty for each crime. And you can go through, and I'm not going to do all that. This isn't about, you know, specifically crimes and, and their punishments. I've gone through that in the past in other sermons. But it, it really is important just to understand who God is, and God is a God of justice, and if we want to know what's right, if we want to know how do you deal with, with these things, we need to look to God's word to understand what's, uh, what is appropriate. And even when you look at things that are sinful but not crimes, right? How do you determine justice? Well, if no one's done anything to you, drunkenness is a sin, but the Bible doesn't have drunkenness as being a crime. Because you're not, you're not harming necessarily anybody by being drunk. Now, there's other things when you, when you 
attack someone else, right? You violate them by, by hitting them or beating them up or whatever. Then that becomes a crime. But when you just get drunk, the Bible doesn't have that as being a crime punishable in the balances. But it is a sin in God. So there's there's two things that you've got to remember with God is that there's a justice that he gives to human government. But then there's the justice of between you and God, right? Because there's sin that makes you separated from God that we need to be reconciled to God with. So while you might not have any debt to owe for sinning again, you know, within human government, because that's a person to person type of a judgment, there is a debt that you owe to God when you sin against God. So everything is based on God being a God of justice. I mean, just the, the fact that we need a Savior is because we're sinners and we deserve a punishment. We deserve hell. And that is the just recompense for our sins, according to God. Now, if you, you know, why, some people might say, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, I, I've, how many people have had that before where you say you show them in Revelation, all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire brimstone, which is the second death. You'll be like, come on, lying like that, that deserves hell? Like, I don't believe that. You know, people say that, and, and, they, and they believe that, and they say, no way. And, and obviously we're saying, look, you know you've done more than just tell a lie. However, even if you didn't, God is the one who determines what is the righteous judgment. And it's not for us to judge God, and we're going to get to that in just a minute too, uh, you know, on what's right and what's wrong. God is the one who defines these things and sets the standard for us. He's a creator. He made things. And God is God represents justice for us. Let's look at Isaiah here, 59. We're going to start reading in verse number 14. There's a, there's a situation being explained where there is no righteousness. There is no judgment. There's no justice happening. And, and that bothers God. We're going to see that, that, that upsets God. And God goes to make things right and actually to bring justice to the situation. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Equity is another term for justice, because you think of equity as like making things equal. Right? You're balancing it out. Verse number 15. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. So, you have people who are trying to do good, right? They're trying to, to not do evil things, trying to say, and they're making themselves a prey. It means other people now are going to pray on them just because they're trying not to do wrong. They're trying to do what's right. This is a situation being described. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. God doesn't like it when there's no judgment. To God doesn't like it when people are just able to get away with whatever, you know, transgressions with, with evilness and, and harming people, and then, and then there's nothing done about it. Verse 16, And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. So God's saying, you know what, I'm going to make this right. Because I don't like that there's no judgment here. I'm going to step in, and I'm going to make sure that there is uh, righteousness here. Verse 17, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and in helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with, a zeal, with zeal as a cloak. This is reference to Jesus Christ himself. We're going to get into that also. There's, there's another passage I want to look at where we're going to look more closely at Jesus being, uh, you know, because he's God possessing the same attributes. But look at verse number 18, the Bible says, according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay. So it's basically, whatever, whatever they're doing, it's going to come back on them. He's not going to let anything go undone or unrewarded or unpunished from what is being done wrong. Uh, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And he's saying, 
That is another reason why people will fear God is because they can't just get away with everything. And that is a good reason to fear. Right? We, we're talking about this morning just, just fearing the wrath and the anger of God. Well, this is one of those things that makes God angry when there's no justice. When people sin against something, there's, there's nothing to balance that out. And that's a reason, another reason to fear God. And, uh, and that's the reason why everyone ought to fear God is just we need to know that God is a God of justice. So if you're going to do wrong to someone else, you better think twice and think about God and fear God before you go and steal from somebody. Before you go and lie with another man's wife. Before you go and commit whatever sin and lie to people and, and, and do whatever, whatever manner of evil against somebody else. You better stop and think and fear God before you go and do those things. Because God makes sure that these wrongs are made right or balanced out with uh, with a penalty. Turn, if you would, to turn to Psalm 50. So in Isaiah 59, that, that, that how much God cares about there being justice and, and being judgment. We often refer to God as just being the judge. And I, and I explain this to people out soul winning also. It's just this concept that you know God is the judge. I was even speaking about this this morning a little bit with one of the visitors, how God is the judge. And it's not that, you know, when we explain salvation to someone and, and explain God's penalties and God's judgment... It's not us becoming the judge of who's going to heaven and who's going to hell as if, as if we have the power to cast somebody into hell. Right? This, is, this is kind of a common complaint that someone might have when they hear us explain the gospel to people and say, Hey, you, know, you deserve to go to hell because you're a sinner. Oh, well, who do you think you are to say that? Well, look, it's not that it's my judgment that is making you go to hell. It's not like I'm the one who decided that. But we have God's judgment. God told us already the way he's going to judge. Because people say, well, you can't judge that. Only God can judge. Well, you know what? God's already judged. And God's given us a whole book of, of his words describing how he will judge everybody when they die. It's already written. It's already ordained. This is the way it is. And God's not going to change his mind. It's, it's not like, well, he might do something different. No. God says, I am the Lord, I change not. He doesn't just, ch he doesn't just change and, and, well, I know I said that before, but I was just kidding, or, you know, whatever. It's the, <laughs> if God is anything, he's true to his word. I mean, it's, God's not a liar. Mm -hmm. So when we explain that to people, it's God's still the judge, but we need to understand how God does judge tells us exactly that. And I'm going to read for you from Judges 11.27. Wherefore I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. The Lord, the judge, be judge this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. God is, is referred to just as the judge. I mean, he is the ultimate judge. He is the one that at the end of the day, you know, you might have a lot of judges on this earth. Some might be good, some might be bad, but God's the ultimate judge. And God sees everything, and God knows everything, and he's the one, ultimately, that's going to determine the correct consequence for everyone. And when you have a bad judge on earth, guess what? It doesn't get past God. At the end of the day, everything is made right. Now, you say, well, Pastor Berzins, how is everything made right for the person who's saved? I mean, I understand for people who are unsaved. Because we can look at, the Bible tells us about the wicked people... And it says, you know, basically not to worry about them because it looks like, oh, man, they're doing all this stuff. They're just completely blaspheming and, and committing sin and committing evil. And they've got all this money and they seem to have everything together. And, you know, almost to the point of being tempted to covet their life and what they're doing. And the Bible teaches us over and over again. Don't worry, because their time is going to come. It may seem for the time being right now that they're getting away with stuff, but they're not. It's just taking a little bit of time before they end up receiving 
for all of their sins, for all of their transgressions, for everything that they've done. And that happens to every unbeliever when they go to hell. They get a recompense of everything that they've done. So in this whole lifetime, someone might seem like, man, they got away with everything. You look at the, the wicked rulers of the world and their riches and their power, and they die at an old age. And it seems like, man, they just lived an entire life of wickedness, and they never really got in trouble. They never went to prison. They never had anything real bad happen to them. Their family's still around. They're not just suffering these losses. Well, when they end up, you know, lifting up their eyes in hell and being in torture and torment, you don't have to worry about that anymore because that is their end. And you say, well, Pastor Ruth, I understand that, and that makes sense to me. And God has evened the scales out and said, okay, you've done all these things, now you're paying for it. Well, what about the, the saved person? Because we've committed sins, and we deserve the punishment of hell. Well, he's balanced those scales out also because Jesus Christ, it's not that, it's not that our sins just go poof and they don't matter anymore. All of our sins had to be paid for. And they were paid for through Jesus Christ. Christ came and took our sins on himself, died on the cross, shed his blood, and his soul went to hell for those three days and three nights before raising again from the dead. So no sin goes unpunished because God is a just judge. And I, and I like to explain this to people at Soul Winning so that they understand, one, understand what Jesus really did for us. And two, to be able to retain the concept that because God is a just judge, you know, our sins, it's not like, you know, people have a concept of forgiveness that might be a little bit skewed when it comes to the sin debt that we owe, right? It's not the same because God is the judge. It's not exactly the same as, as someone owing you money, you just say, well, just forget about it, right? Because that is the one way of forgive, forgive debt. <clears throat> when it comes to our transgressions because we've broken the law against God, there is a penalty that needs to be paid. But the reason why, because God doesn't just say, well, I'll just pretend like it didn't happen. He doesn't do that at all because a, a just judge can't just do that. You can't just look the other way. You can't just, just let things go unpunished. And a God of justice definitely cannot do that. That's right, man. God is the judge. So he did have to pour out the penalty for every single sin that's been, that's been made on this earth. And Jesus came and made the payment for us. And, and all of the punishment was, was doled out on him. So every sin that you've done, it's not that you just get away with it. Jesus had to pay for it. That when I fell on his shoulders. That's right. And that way, God can still be the just judge that he is because he's made sure that every infraction, every penalty has had its balance. But that also provides us with the opportunity to still receive forgiveness because it was paid for through somebody else. And it was imputed unto us. And that is, that is an extremely important, I mean, that's, that's part of who God is. God is the judge. It's a really important characteristic to understand of God. And that, and, and you know, and this, is, this goes hand in hand with this morning, too, because this is not like, um, how did that verse go? It was, it was the, um, I'm sorry, my mind's a little foggy this morning, this, this morning, this evening. Um. You were basically, they were saying, like, well, we've already been delivered, right? So we commit whatever sin, and we've already been delivered, so who cares? We can't have that attitude, because God is still a, a, a righteous judge. And we need, we need to understand that about God and the judgment of God, that we can't just be like, oh, well, it doesn't really matter anyways, because it all does matter. Now, I had you turn to Psalm chapter 50. Look at verse number 4 in Psalm 50. The Bible says... He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Another reference here, God being judge. But notice in verse number four, 
It says that he may judge his people. So God is not just the God the judge of the lost, of the unsaved. He is a judge over his own people. And we need to remember that. God's going to maintain those scales of equity within, uh, within his own people, within, you know, with his children. And, uh, you know, it's, we don't just get it. Just because we, we receive forgiveness of an eternal punishment, that doesn't change the, the temporal punishments that, that come our way when we sin. Uh, turn over, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. One of the good things about God being a judge is that he really is a just judge. And that what he does is right. And even from our own concept of understanding of judge, that judgment that he's given to us naturally, in the sense that God is a defender of those that are helpless and that can't stand up for themselves. And that God is not a respecter of persons. And this goes into that, that judge, you know, justice being blind. It doesn't matter who is the victim and who is the accused, right? God will, will measure justice appropriately, just the way that it ought to be given out uh, in every single situation. And, and God, because people who are helpless are a lot more likely to be taken advantage of and have judgments go against them and just, and just have all kinds of extra problems because they can't do anything about it because they're easy targets. Unfortunately, that's something that happens in this wicked world way too often. That's right. You've got corrupt judges. You've got corrupt law officials that they think, well... You know, this person's a prostitute, or this person's homeless, or this person, you know, and, and they, they could just get away with not dealing with things and not, you know, making sure that certain crimes are paid for, and, and or, or you have someone who's got a lot of money, right? What was the guy's name? Epstein? How long did he get away with his crimes and his sins and his perversion and, and everything? And it was like public knowledge, yet... How long does it take before anything's even being done about it? Why? Because we have unjust judges. I'm using that term loosely, the judges, right? I mean, people who are going to hold him, people who are supposed to be holding him accountable. But God doesn't look at people that way and you can say, oh man, he's gone this whole life and he's done all these things. Yeah, but guess where he is now? He's receiving what was coming to him his, for his whole life. Uh, in Deuteronomy 10, I'm going to read this for you. Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. And that's another thing that, that corrupts judges is bribes, right? God doesn't, God doesn't need any bribes. God's not going to take any bribes. He's not gonna, there's nothing you can offer to God that's going to change God's opinion on, get, on giving out justice. This is the way things are, and he doesn't. It doesn't matter who the people are. He doesn't. You think God's impressed with any man on this earth of just like, oh, oh well, sorry, Mister So and So. Okay, well, if it's coming from you, then no. Oh. God's looking down on a whole bunch of sinners on this on this world, and, and it, it probably amuses them that some people just think they're so much better than everybody else, and it probably irritates them a little bit too. I would imagine. For, especially when people are really wicked and they, and they like to hold themselves up really high and look down their nose on, on the common folk, right, as being second-class citizens or whatever. God's like, I know your sin is way worse than these guys. But God doesn't regard persons. He doesn't take reward. The Bible says he doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. God is all about truth and justice. In, in a given situation, it doesn't matter how much financial means a person has. He just wants things done right. And he looks out for, and, and, and again, thank God that God is a God of justice. Because 
Oftentimes, the fatherless and the widow, these are people who have nobody looking out for them, right? The fatherless. It's, it's not their fault for whatever situation they're in. These children, they don't have, they, they just, they don't have people looking out for them. Orphans, right? People just, they've been abandoned. Widows, they've had people die and they're left alone. And, and what are they going to do? God looks out for those people. Now we ought to, but God will look out for those people because God wants to make sure that justice happens. And on this earth, there are wicked people that'll take advantage of those people because they can't do anything about it because they're 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 helpless. But God makes sure that everything balances out in the end. And when people decide to be wickedly, they're going to get that coming back on their own head. I mean, the Bible says. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's the justice of God. That is God making sure that whatever it is that you're sowing, whatever it is you're doing, it's going to come back on you. If it's good, God makes sure that good comes back to you. And, and, this, and this is all appropriate. This is good. This is, this is great about God. God's making sure, hey, well, if you just keep doing good, keep doing good, keep doing good in your life, know that God is a God of justice and equity. God sees what you do, and he'll make sure, hey, in the end, ultimately, and now it doesn't always happen just immediately, but in the end, God makes sure that everything balances out. It's in his timing, but if you can just have the faith and just keep going, keep sowing good, do what's right, God will make sure, hey, you're recompensed. You can live your whole life here, and just keeping your nose down and doing your work and doing what God asked for you to do, and, and never really having financial riches, never really feeling comfortable, never really, you know, having things together and always dealing with all these problems and things. But at the end of your life, God will give you your rewards. And they're going to be great. And, 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 and you think about it this way. If you consider, there are some people consider hell to be real extreme for, the, for certain sins. Well, God is balanced in the sense that as much as hell is this really bad place, and people who, you know, the more they sin, kind of get in this lower hell, and just just worse and worse place with hell. Heaven's the same way, just on the exact opposite end of the, of the scale. It's great. It's awesome. It's, it's, it's going to be better than any of us expect or think about. And you might think some little, some little sin can get you into hell. Well, some little works are going to get you rewards in heaven, too. And God's going to, to, to bless on that and make sure that, that all the little things that you do don't just go unnoticed by God. And that's, and that's great. That's encouraging to know that. And, it, and it's also encouraging to know that God's not going to let uh, judgment fail. I had to turn to Ezekiel chapter 18. This is an important point. I've hit on it recently in the past, but I want to cover it from this passage here. Ezekiel chapter 18. Now, I'm not going to get into... I probably should in another sermon. Ezekiel 18 is one of those passages that, that the work salvation crowd really likes to just turn on its head. Because it talks about people you know, turning from their sin and basically receiving salvation from God. It's not talking about person's soul being saved, but you know that's that's another sermon for another day. But I want to make another point on this passage. Look at verse number twenty-three in Ezekiel eighteen. The Bible says, "If I had any pleasure at all that the wicked should die," said the Lord God, "and not that he should return from his ways and live." But God's saying it's better when a person's doing wrong that they can get it right, fix it, and then start doing right. Makes sense. And he says in verse 24, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. So God's explaining his judgment. He's saying, when people are in sin, I, it's like, I want them to turn from that sin and to start doing right. And when you have somebody, and he's saying, if they, if they can get their act together and get right, 
God will extend mercy unto them and allow them to live. But when you have someone who's been doing right, but then they just go off and start committing abomination, they've already known, you're saying, they're not going to live. He's like, no, judgment is going to come on that person. And here's what, what they say in verse 25, yet ye say the way of the Lord is not equal. No, he's telling the people, you're saying that my ways are not equal. And that's not right. And this is what people think. Well, I've done all this good, and now I do this one bad thing. And you're saying, now oh, I've got to die for that. And this person did all these other bad things, and now he starts doing right. But he gets to live, and I have to die. That's not right. And this is people using their own philosophy and their own worldly wisdom to determine right and wrong instead of going to God and saying, God, tell me what's right and what's wrong in this situation. And people do this way too often. And judging God, he said, you say the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When you start going to God saying your ways are not equal, you've got a serious problem and you're, you're lacking wisdom and understanding. And it's not God's fault that you can't understand. And this is where people get into that area of making their own idols and making their own gods and making God out to be who they want him to be instead of who he actually is. Well, that just doesn't sound right. I don't see how that can make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't matter if it makes sense to you. It makes sense to me, and just because it doesn't make sense to you doesn't make it wrong. And this is what God's saying. He's like, what do you mean? Aren't my ways equal and your ways are not equal? And he's going to rebuke him and tell him here in verse 26, when a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. There's nothing unrighteous in that. He was doing good, but hey, man, you commit iniquity and you die for that. Well, then that's, that's what you get, right? You're reaping what you sow. And again, verse 27, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet said the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. And this ties in, again, with, with God being merciful to the people who are getting right. But still holding a high standard on, no, you need to, you need to do what's right. And the people who are doing good and, and then committing abomination, if they die, that's, that's what they get. Uh, verse number 31, the Bible says, Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. When these people want to judge God, he's saying, You know what? I'm going to judge you. You think my ways aren't right? Well, you better get your act together because I'm about to judge you. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. I'm going to read to, you for, read to you from Jeremiah 23. Your turn to Revelation 19. Jeremiah 23, 5 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is that branch of David that's being prophesied as being a king that's going to reign and prosper and he shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. This is a future prophecy because when Jesus came the first time, he didn't come to rule and to reign, but we know that he is coming back again to set up his kingdom here on earth where he will be ruling and reigning. And we're going to see that in Revelation 19. And the reason why I really want to look at Revelation 19 is because this is also going to give us an idea of how he's going to judge. How is Jesus Christ going to judge? When he came to the earth the first time, see, when we read the Bible, and especially when you read the Gospels, and you read what Jesus did, his ministry was to seek and to save that which was lost. 
He did not come to be a judge. That wasn't the purpose of his first coming. So we want to make sure that we don't get an imbalanced view of who Jesus is in his entirety just based off of the purpose of his original coming to the earth. Right? Let's not confuse the second coming of Jesus Christ with the first coming of Jesus Christ when he came and, and he said, you know, man, who made me a, a judge over you? And, and um, you know, when people are coming to him about their financial issues and all oh, this guy had this problem, he's like, look, that's not why I'm here. And they brought the woman taken in adultery. That's not why he was there. He was there to die for people. He was there to be the savior. He was there to, to pay for sin and to do good and to help people. He wasn't there to be put and set up as the ruler and set up as the king as many people wanted him to be. That wasn't the purpose of his mission. But he is coming back. And that will be what he's coming back as when he comes back to set up his kingdom. He's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords. And he will be ruling and reigning over all the world at that time. And he will be the judge. And we're going to read about that in, in Revelation 19. And just so you understand, when Jesus sets up his kingdom... And there's a woman taken in adultery, and he's the judge of the earth. Jesus is going to execute justice. The first time he came to be able to offer the forgiveness, to be able to pay for the sins. But the second time, he's in charge. This is He is the judge, and that is the role he's going to be filling. And things are going to be done according to his law and according to his way. He's not going to be under Roman law. He's not going to be under any other man-made law. It's going to be Jesus Christ's government and God's law instituted. Look at verse number 11, Revelation 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He that sits on the white horse, this is Jesus Christ. That's why he's called faithful and true. And we're going to see a little bit later, too. He's, where he's called the Word of God, and he has a name written on his side, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is undoubtedly Jesus Christ. But what is he coming to do? In righteousness, he does judge. So he's a judge, and he makes war. He's not coming to bring peace. He's making war. Yeah, let's understand who Jesus is in his entirety. When he comes back, this is one of the things he's going to be doing. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Remember John 1, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's Jesus Christ. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Does it sound like Jesus is going to be a pushover when he sets up his kingdom and he brings a sword to smite the nations of the earth? And, he, and he's saying, I'm in charge now and I'm going to set up my rule. And people are like, oh, well, he's just, I mean, he's just full of forgiveness, right? We could just get away with it because it's Jesus. No, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Iron is unbendable and unmoving and it's very strong and firm and it's, it is not going to change. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Verse 16, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. This is a result of the war that Jesus wages on these unright, on these wicked nations that are on the earth. When he sets up his kingdom, he's ruling with a rod of iron. This is a result. You have a lot of dead bodies. And that's why he's inviting the birds. Hey, 
come and have a feast. And all these people that stood up against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That is Jesus Christ. That's his judgment. That's him making war and making things right and setting up a righteous kingdom. Verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with them the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That's the judgment of Jesus Christ. So don't, you know, again, it, the whole point is to have this proper view of who God is. Jesus is God. Who the Father is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is. They all possess the same qualities collectively as God. It's the same qualities. Same characteristics. Same attributes. Jesus doesn't have different attributes as far as his characteristics. It's the same character. The Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son. It's all one God. All the same characteristics. Jesus has the same level of justice, wrath, vengeance that the Father has. Same characteristics. And we see these exhibited right here in Revelation 19. Now I'm going to spend the last part of the sermon going over the vengeance of God. Because this is tied in perfect with justice, right? Vengeance is, think about someone taking revenge. If someone were to take revenge, what are you doing? You're trying to right something that was wrong. Someone's transgressed against you, someone does something to you. If you want to take vengeance on them, you're going to say, oh, well, I'm going to pay you back. Right? You did this to me, now you're going to pay for this. Well, the Bible tells us that it's not our jobs to take vengeance on people when someone does wrong to us. Because that job specifically belongs to God. Because God is the just judge. We're supposed to let God deal with those things. When someone does us wrong, you know what? Let God deal with them. Because then, one, we're not going to screw it up by trying to make things right the way that we think they should be made right. God will make sure that they're done right. And also, you know, when, when we give judgment on someone, maybe it wasn't even enough, but God's just going to let that go then because we decided to take matter in our own hands. Let's just let him do it. And then God will look at that and he'll see the right spirit in us and bless us for that. So when you're being wrong by someone else, he'll just make it right anyways. In the end. There are about three pages of... I, all I did here, I did, a, I did just a real quick word search just on vengeance because this is in the Bible a lot too. And I don't know if I'm going to read through all of them. But it's important to understand this. I was I had another conversation with someone that was that despises God. And you know, you have conversations with this, like this, with people who are atheists, with people who just hate the God of the Bible, and they just refuse to accept God for who he is. And they said that, oh, you believe in this vindictive God. Yeah, I do. I do. And if you don't believe in a vindictive God, because it, the word vindictive means that it comes from vengeance. Like they're, they're, they're a God that's going to take vengeance on people. Yes, I, I believe in a vindictive God, because that's who the Bible says that God is. How, how, could, how could God have vengeance and not be called vindictive? Right. But see, that's another one of those words that people throw around is like a bad word. Oh man, you're vindictive. Now, if it's applied to us, that could be bad because that's not our job to seek vengeance against people, right? But not against God. That's not a bad attribute or quality of God to be vindictive. Actually, it's a good thing because he's the one making right the things that are wrong. He's the one taking vengeance for us. So you can't, I mean, if you if you believe in a God that's not vindictive, you don't believe in the God of the Bible. Bottom line. 
Genesis chapter 4. You don't have to turn. You know what? Turn to, um, turn to Ezekiel 25. That's, that's definitely one place I've got to make sure I cover. I mean, going back to Genesis, you've got with the situation with Cain and Abel. God says, you know, anyone that slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken out of him sevenfold. Who's going to be the one taking vengeance? God will be. He's the one making sure. He says, you know what? I've already given judgment in this situation. So if anyone goes and tries to, to go above my judgment, my penalty on him, then I'm going to make sure that it comes down on you. So don't touch him. I've already given him, you know, what, what he's got coming to him. Anyone else now that, that wants to add to my punishment, I'm going to bring vengeance <clears throat> on you. And he says, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. God says, you want to go above and beyond what I've done? I'm going to make it seven times worse for you. That's pretty serious. Deuteronomy 32, 35 says, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Deuteronomy 32, 41 says, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. <coughs> Deuteronomy 32, 43, Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and will render vengeance to his adversaries. Judges 11.36 says, For as much as the Lord had taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. Psalm 58.10, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. And that's another real powerful verse in Psalm 58 about... Righteous people rejoicing at God taking vengeance on people. Why? Because it's justice. Because justice is served. That ought to make people happy and rejoice. Justice is served. Amen. And there's a, there's a serious void when justice is not served. And just like God with the opening uh, passage didn't like to see that there's no judgment. There's no justice being served. So he stepped in and made sure that there's going to be justice. We have a void when justice is not being served. And it, and it actually harms people to not have justice served. We ought to, that's why our, our government ought to be set up in a way that it's giving out the right penalties and right punishment so that they don't have that void of a lack of justice. And, and where I'm going with this is you think about people who have serious crimes committed against them. Like children who are defiled. Where the Bible would say that that person needs to be put to death. Right. Amen. That's a death penalty. There, there's no, there, you should take no reward for that person. You can't just, just say, oh, well, he paid this big fine, so we're going to let him go. No. They need to be put to death. And, you know, the victim, the people who have this happen to them, they have so much extra damage taken upon them when justice is not served. Because when they see these people who have destroyed their lives just getting a slap on the wrist and then just back out on the street again after a few months or whatever or maybe no prison time at all and just, it's like, it's like nothing happened. And it's, one of, it's the worst thing in the world that happens to this person and nothing happens to him. That does so much extra damage on top of what's already been done. We ought to love these victims enough to show them, say, this is unacceptable. This is not tolerated in our society, and we're going to execute justice that God says is going to be, that ought to be executed upon this. And you're going to see, hey, if someone did this to you, that's so wicked, they're dying for it. And you can at least understand that what they did is really that wrong. And it's not just not that big of a deal because they're just out walking around again free to go and defile other people. Yeah. And this is, this is one of the things. I, our country needs to get this right. I mean, I, I don't understand how it's gotten so far off course other than the fact that you just have a bunch of uh, spiritual wickedness in high places right. by a bunch of pedophiles and perverts that are in charge and, and are weakening these laws anyways right. yeah. because they're guilty of it. And that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Because any normal person would say, absolutely, hang him high, you know, shoot him twice in the head. Not just once, shoot. unload on him. 
Get the firing squad out there and, and riddle them with bullets. Because that's what they deserve. And that's a proper justice and judgment. And you know what? God's instilled that in us. And that's what's right. Now, it's not right for the person to just take the law into their own hands and execute that vengeance themselves because that's what the vengeance is you're taking you're taking revenge for what someone's done to you but the human government needs to step in and take care of those crimes that are being committed let's keep let's keep going through this and and when you see the righteous the righteous rejoice if a pedophile is put to death the righteous ought to say amen praise god that's good I'm glad to see that guy dead. In fact, I'd, I'd like to wash my feet in his blood. His stinking blood that goes and defiles these, these innocent children. Kill them all. Amen. The righteous rejoice. Say, oh, that's such a carnal attitude to have. Not according to scripture. That's right, amen. And read all of Psalm 58. You'll, you'll get the full picture. Psalm 94, verse 1, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance, vengeance belongeth, show thyself. And this is in treating God. God, you're the one in charge of vengeance. You know, show yourself. There's nothing wrong with going to God and, and asking God, say, God, you're the one that needs to revenge this when, when you're wrong and beg God, ask God to take vengeance. That's not, a, that's not the wrong thing to do. Um, Especially when people do that, that type of wickedness. Verse uh, Psalm 99, verse 8. We're getting to Ezekiel soon. Psalm 99, 8. Thou answerest them, O Lord our God. Thou wast a God that forgavest them, though thou tookest vengeance on their inventions. Uh, Isaiah 34, 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. You get the picture. I want to go through... Jeremiah eleven twenty, but O Lord of hosts that judges righteously, that tries the reins in the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. For unto thee have I revealed my cause. Again, righteous people asking for the vengeance of God to come upon those that have done wickedly and done wrong. Say, God, I need to see your vengeance. I need to see justice being served here. There is a need when people have been wrong to, sh to see that those things have been, have been righted. Day of the Lord being a day of vengeance. Uh, let's look at Ezekiel 25. I don't want to belabor the point here just because there's, there's so much scripture on this. To say that God is not a God of vengeance is just absolute, utter nonsense. And the same people that want to say that are the same ones that just basically want to make the Bible say Whatever they want it to say because they don't like what it actually says. Yeah. And this is where you turn to the theologians, right? And they want to use a bunch of big words to make themselves sound real educated and, and to throw people off because they don't know what you're talking about because you're using words that nobody uses. So you want to try to sound, puff yourself up and sound real smart when you come out with just total rank heresy. And when you come out... And, and completely deny what the scripture says at face value because, oh, well, I'm so smart and you're not that smart, so, oh, yeah, you think it says it, it means this when it really means something completely different than what it says. That's the tactic that many people use, that these theologians use to try to make the Bible, for example, endorse homosexuality. Right. It's like, are you smoking crack? <laughs> What passage can you try to, to, to twist to say that that's acceptable and okay and not abominable? There's so many things that are just so simple. But when people don't want to accept the Bible for what it is and God for who he is, you, you have to do something with it. You know, People just want to claim Christianity for whatever reason, but really don't want to accept the word of God. 
Ezekiel 25, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And I will execute judgments upon Moab, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and hath greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out mine hand upon Edom, and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And they shall do in Edom according to mine anger and according to my fury. And they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. You see how all these things tie together from this morning, this evening? They're going to know my anger, they're going to know my fury, and they're going to know my vengeance. And I'm going to bring vengeance upon them. Verse 15, thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out mine hand upon the Philistines, and I will cut off the Carathims and destroy the remnant of the seacoast, and I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. How are they going to know that he's the Lord? Because he's going to bring vengeance. That's how they're going to know. Because that's part of who God is. It's his job to bring vengeance. And what's making them so mad? Because these people in Edom and the Philistines, they were taking vengeance into their own hands, and they thought that they were going to do this vengeance. God says, no, no, no. Because you did that, now I'm going to bring vengeance on you. They were unrighteous in what they were doing, and God brought the vengeance. And he says, you're going to know that I'm the Lord because of my vengeance. God is a God that, that revenges, that brings vengeance. And he does it in justice and in equity. God doesn't overdo it. If anything, he underdoes it because of his mercy. If anything. But there isn't even that because of the proper balance that he maintains. It is proper equity. Uh, Micah chapter 5 verse 15 and I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen such as they have not heard we saw this in Nahum this morning uh, verse number 2 of chapter 1 God is jealous and the Lord revenge the Lord revenge and is furious the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies Romans 3 5 but if our unrighteousness can mend the righteousness of God what shall we say is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance I speak as a man is God unrighteous no does God take vengeance sure does Romans 12 19 dearly beloved avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath give place to wrath give place to vengeance why? Because that's God's it. Let God have the wrath, let God have the vengeance. That's his place. Not ours. Vengeance is, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Let's trust in him. Hebrews 10.30 also, for we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. We don't need to worry about making sure that everything that's wrong is made right. God does that. That's part of who God is. That's part of his job. That's part of God being the judge. God will make sure that, that all the wrongs are made right and all the rights are rewarded. We just need to trust in God and have faith in God and understand this is who God is. And, and Jesus Christ is going to judge this world one day perfectly according to God's word. And you know what? We should look forward to that. We really ought to, I mean, I'm looking forward to that. It, it kind of wears on you when you see all of the injustices around you just on a daily basis. And how much inequity there is. And people being wrongfully in prison and punished for things that, that shouldn't be crimes. And then on the other hand, you've got people not being punished for things that are serious crimes. And everything's just kind of backwards not when Jesus Christ comes to rule and reign he's going to reign with a rod of iron 
There's going to be no getting to him. There's going to be no people in power and authority, you know, bribing Jesus. He's going to make sure everything is done rightly. And don't forget, too, you know, when Jesus sets up his reign, it's not that the world's just going to be filled with all saved people. There's going to be unsaved people. There's going to be nations. There's going to be other people that exist in the millennial reign of Christ. But it's going to be done in order according to Jesus Christ's rule. So we're going to get to actually see how all of that's going to work and could work even with unsaved people on the earth with Jesus Christ being the king. Which is how he's supposed to be during the time of Israel. God is supposed to be king and they had judges set up on the earth. But now instead of God being farther off, he's setting up his throne right here on earth for that millennial reign. Yeah, that's going to be a good time to look forward to. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for being a God of justice and a God of vengeance. Uh, Lord, that really is a weight that is that is lifted off of our shoulders if we have to, to struggle with and worry about people who have done some serious uh, wrongs, maybe unto us, that we don't have to worry about, about making it right because you will do that. That, that type of uh, vengeance can really eat a person up. And I pray that you would please help us to Remain faithful and understand that, that we don't have to take that burden on ourselves, but we can leave that unto you because that really is your job. And, and Lord, um, we thank you for, for being so righteous and being a God of, of uh, equity and, and giving us such a perfect law. God, help us to look to your words, to help us to form our own understanding of right and wrong and not just come up with our own man-made ideas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to turn to one last song before we're dismissed.